Thank you, Ian. Um, so I will talk um, to you about work I did that I did not do alone. Um, I had lots of collaborators, among them Sascha Fall, who will, who's uh, sick right now, but who will be at the reception later. Um, Simpson Garfinkel um, and uh, Michelle Mazrik, who's um, from Maryland, um, and other colleagues, local colleagues um, from Germany where I work. And um, the idea for, uh, for this work was that um, Michelle Mazrik and Simpson Garfinkel had sat down and talked about, um, you know, we've, we've been talking about usable security a lot, and um, has there been effort on making cryptographic APIs more usable, and if so, was it successful? And um, they, they couldn't find a source that um, had done the work that they were interested in, so they decided that we, we should do it together. And um, so as everybody knows, um, cryptography is hard for developers uh, to implement. And in uh, my field, usable um, security, there's been a lot of talking about like maybe these people are just not motivated and um, maybe if you, um, if you incentivize it better, if you, if you kind of get um, evaluated on security results too, maybe that uh, motivates people to try harder. But then we have other, um, other things happening where um, people who are strongly motivated to uh, correctly um, write cryptographic code or, or use cryptographic APIs fail. So um, we were kind of thinking maybe, maybe it's not just, um, just not um, motivation for developers, maybe it's actually um, a usability problem that even if you want to do something, um, you, might, you might just not um, figure out how to do it correctly. And if we look at um, the usability problem, we have um, various factors that, that could actually be looked at. So um, one thing that people have said would contribute to the usability um, of cryptographic APIs would be if having um, fail-safe defaults. So um, whenever people don't specify something, it should be kind of a secure default that they fall back on. Then there's um, talk about documentation that should give you a clear idea of what you can do and cannot do. And for the things that you can do, it should provide you maybe examples of how to do it so you don't have to figure it out yourself. Then there's a talk about the complexity. Um, and um, the idea is that the more choices you have, the more um, sources of uh, mistakes you have. So maybe, um, maybe we should simplify APIs. Then also, again, um, if you don't have a full feature list that you offer, maybe somewhat contrarily, people might just get frustrated, give up, or use something else entirely. Then you should provide meaningful failure. That is, um, when something does not work, tell people why it did not work, and fail in a way that people um, learn something from it and can, can quickly go on, um, maybe only using your documentation or maybe only using your, your, um, your message that you're sending and not going on the internet and, and Googling around. And then maybe um, the abstraction level or even um, um, yeah, the, the learnability in, in a way. Um, how many things do you have to look at un until you understand what you, can actually, what you can actually do or what you need to do to achieve your goal? So um, luckily for us, there are several um, APIs designed specifically for usability. And um, we decided to look at some of them. And usability, in, um, in a way, for the developers who developed those, seem to have been mostly um, simplifying the, the set of choices and also picking secure defaults and also offering fewer options. So our research question in the, in the study that we did that I'm presenting was, do cryptographic APIs designed for usability actually lead to better security? And we evaluated this question um, by doing an online study with Python developers. In this study, we did prime developers that they had to write secure code, so we suggested to them that they were um, working on a tool that would allow citizen scientists all over the world to collect um, data maybe on human trafficking and that when cryptography in this um, application that they should be writing or in this code base that they were working on failed, they would put actual humans at risk. Um, and also we picked the library that they should use for them so we didn't evaluate um, which choice they made, but we evaluated how well they could work with the library that we picked for them. 
We used um, Python as our programming language because it has many developers that we could recruit from, because it has bindings for all popular cryptographic APIs that we could think of, and because it had those APIs designed especially for usability. We narrowed our choice down to um, five libraries, which I'll briefly talk about. Um, they had roughly similar sets of features, and only some claimed to be usable. So um, if we look at um, PyCrypto, that's basically the, the most popular crypto library on Python, so we use it as a quasi-baseline. And then we had M2 crypti Crypto, which is one OpenSSL binding. Um, it is not the official one, but the official one doesn't have support for the basic crypto task that we later decided on, so we had to pick this one. Um, then we um, used Cryptography IO, which um, claims that they do crypto for humans. Um, they offer somewhat complete documentation and they simply simplify um, some methods, but they also offer access to the more complicated things you can do if you're knowledgeable. Then we picked um, Google's Keysart to look at, um, which is uh, supposed to make cryptography easier and safer for humans, but which did not support the full feature set that we picked. Um, and then in the end we picked um, Pinnacle, which um, is said to avoid disaster. It's a binding for salt. There's also um, PySodium, which would also be a binding, um, which has a slightly better, um, larger user base. But it, um, but it was beta when we did the study and didn't have documentation. So these were the libraries that we picked. The lower three were the ones that were designed with usability in mind. To evaluate um, them for usability, we had to have people use them. And we did that by asking um, developers that we recruited to um, solve certain tasks for us. So we had um, two sets of tasks that we gave to different people in, a, in our study, um, because otherwise it would have taken um, them too long and they would also have been able to learn. And then kind of in the second set of encryption tasks, they would have maybe been faster. So to one set of people, we gave a symmetric set of tasks where they should um, encrypt, decrypt, generate keys and um, store them securely. And this was challenging in the way that they should pick a strong key and that they should store it securely. Um, to other people, we gave the asymmetric set of tasks, which were also encrypting and decrypting and key generation and storage. And also they were supposed to do um, certificate validation where they should check um, the signature and where they should check the host name. Sadly, we were not able to um, do all of these tasks with er every library, but we thought that these were basic crypto tasks, so we wanted to look at them. And we also thought um, that when a library did not support something this basic, it should somehow say so, so that people should quickly figure out that this was not doable and just skip to the next task. Um, solutions could be either secure or insecure, and when we collected the code, we later checked what people actually did. We had in the past tried to do large-scale lab studies, which um, did not really work out well for us. And also at our local universities, there were no um, large Python classes. So we decided to do an online study. Um, you can see the uh, online study environment that we have. It has the option to, um, to skip a task or to um, say you're done and move to the next, next task. You can test and you can also um, try to get unstuck when you, get, when you got stuck. We offered people a code skeleton where they should only fill in certain methods so it wouldn't take too long. And we were able to measure the code that they wrote, the time that they took on the task, whether or not they copied and pasted and where they clicked, and also when they dropped out of the study. For the people who did their tasks um, all the way through the end or skipped all the way through the end, we gave them an exit questionnaire where we asked them uh, several questions that we felt were important to usability. So we asked them whether or not they felt that they were functionally successful in the tasks that they worked on, and we also asked whether they felt that the solutions they had written were secure. We felt that um, being able to tell when you've actually um, solved something securely um, is associated with um, an using an API that's usable. Also, we used the um, SUS, this is the um, system, system usability score, um, where you ask, Usually on software systems, you ask questions like, would you recommend this to a friend? Um, rate um, whether 
or rate how much you agree with the question. Um, I liked using this. Um, it's, it's kind of designed to, to measure the usability of a system and it's only somewhat appropriate for, for APIs. Because would you recommend it to a friend? Would you, would you like using it? That's maybe a strong, strong thing to say about this. So from, uh, from literature that we, that we found, we kind of um, drew up the things that other people thought were um, important for having usable APIs, like having good documentation, being able to tell when you've made a mistake, um, when you've made a mistake, being able to move on quickly. Um, and we asked these questions um, as well, in a, in a similar way, where they should rate agreement. And then in the end, we asked demographic questions so we could kind of tell whether or not we were working with experts. We drew these people um, by emailing GitHub developers who had uh, committed to Python repositories and invited, randomly invited people. We were not able to offer them compensation, but still some of them participated. Lots of emails also bounced, and very, very few people complained. Um, you can see here that we had 256 valid participants of 1,500 and something that started. So lots of people dropped out of the study. We had, um, most of the people we had in our study were professionals, and most of them also had no security background. So one of the, um, the uh, diagram you see here kind of compares um, how active someone is on, um, on uh, GitHub to um, how active someone who um, actually finished the study is on, is on GitHub. So on average, um, the, the dark blue is the people who we send invite emails to, and the light blue is people who actually participated in our study. So you can see that um, the people who participated were somewhat more active, but maybe, maybe not. Um, we, didn't, we didn't reach like one complete end of the population, but, but somewhat average, maybe slightly more active than average. So one important metric we thought um, that had to do with usability was whether or not people who started the study actually would be able to finish. So in the asymmetric condition, compared to the symmetric condition, twice as many people just stopped working on the task at some point. Um, in general, um, in, in PyCrypto and Cryptography IO, um, fused people dropped out at some point in the study. And um, the dropouts were also twice as likely as for those libraries when people had been assigned to M2 Crypto or to Keysar. And, and um, this could be um, either incomplete documentation or it could also be, um, we later thought, um, maybe not being able to tell quickly whether or not a feature is offered and then searching, searching, and at some point just giving up. So if we look at um, functionality results split up by task, we can see that this varies wildly. It varies wildly by, um, by tasks and it varies wildly by, um, by the API that people were restricted to. So um, you can see that um, the light blues, can you actually, see? Well, the, well the nearly white bar at the top, <laughs> that's, uh, that's symmetric key generation and storage, and it moves from there to the dark blue at the bottom that is uh, the tiniest most of the time that is certificate validation. And um, the, um, that usually for most, um, for most um, APIs, asymmetric tasks were the hardest to solve. And certificate validation, the dark blue, was the hardest, uh, the hardest among all. If we look at security, so try to keep this uh, bar chart in mind, we see that it looks vastly different. So here, if I skip back, where for Pi Crypto and M2 Crypto, you can see that lots of the tasks were somewhat functionally done. It is way less here. So secure key generation and storage was um, very hard and no single participant managed to do secure certificate validation in our study. If we look at um, results by API and not no longer by, split by task, we can see that um, Functionality was, um, was, was pretty, um, pretty good um, for symmetric and PyCrypto, for example. 
and the worst altogether for Kizar, especially in the asymmetric en encryption, which it doesn't, doesn't um, support well. What we found was that when we detected that people had copied and pasted a code snippet into their result, they had a three times the chance of getting a functionally um, working solution as people who did not find a, a, a snippet to copy and paste or maybe wrote code from scratch. Now, if we look at um, security, suddenly Kizar, that has the least functional results, has the most, um, has the most secure results out of those that were functional because we did not evaluate whether or not something was secure that was not solved. Um, so you can see here that this is kind of, kind of weird and hard now because what do we want? So the, the ideal solution, of course, is that everybody is able to solve each task and it should also be solved securely, um, which none of these really achieved. But then what is, what is the next best? Solving a crypto task in a way that it, it actually kind of does something, it encrypts in some way, but then having it um, work insecurely so it can be cracked? Or would you rather have something that can just not be solved at all? Which I'm, not, I'm not going to answer this, I'm just saying we have different results all over the field here. So if we look at um, what differentiated um, things from working um, and things from not working, the SUS score that we, um, that we collected um, help with functionality. So um, whenever that was especially bad, which was, um, which was the case for our participants for Kizar and M2 Crypto, um, the functionality was also especially bad. But none here was ranked more than mediocre for, um, for normal software, but we don't know how this compares to maybe um, scoring of uh, normal APIs because nobody has, has really um, collected a large data set of usability of APIs at all. So it, it's, um, it's hard to say whether or not they were all really horribly usable or if it was just that APIs compared to some clicking tool that you might use are just um, hard to use. And also designing for usability did not actually lead to good perceived usability by our users as we can see in Kisa being ranked very low in um, usability. Good documentation could actually differentiate. We got lots of comments on how um, some bad documentation was not useful or people dropped out and said that documentation was just not useful. And also um, the library that did comparably well does offer um, low level functionality and also helpful documentation. Um, and it led to the best combination of functionality and security results. Um, and also somehow full functionality is important because um, in our study, when people were not able to tell whether or not they could proceed with the task with the library they had, they just dropped out and in real life, the library will just probably not be used because people just cannot tell um, whether or not it can do a thing, so it's, it's practically useless in many cases. Um, so we were thinking maybe um, there were different things that the participants brought to the table that maybe differentiated um, what worked and what did not work, but we couldn't find that their experience in, in Python and with programming in general did matter in, in any way. Um, we also found that security background almost mattered to security results, but even people who said that they had a security background, that they had worked in IT security or that they had taken classes on security, were not able to produce significantly um, better results than the others. And now let's look at the scary solutions. That would be the ones for me that work um, on the surface but um, that are insecure and you can't tell. And that were 20% of, um, of the insecure solutions were believed to be secure by the, by the participants. And this sadly, scarily did not, dif um, difference, um, oh, did not differ by the API that people um, used to solve the task. So none was good or especially bad at um, helping people figure out whether or not their solution was secure. So, what did we do? We investigated ways to measure the usability of especially cryptographic APIs in a developer study. We used the um, SUS, which uh, is used widely for normal software, maybe for end users too. Um, and if, even, if, 
even though the questions do not really apply here, the, the final score that you get by using it somewhat correlates with um, solving tasks, but not solving them securely. We tried asking diagnostic questions, and um, at least we could tell um, whether or not people who were not able to use something also thought um, the documentation was bad. We measured functional task success as maybe as a metric of um, usability of something, but maybe for usability of something that does crypto is more, so maybe we need to measure secure solutions, or maybe we need to measure the fraction of secure solutions out of all the functional solutions, because when someone doesn't do anything at all, they just go away, and then they at least don't write insecure code. Or maybe we should measure the usability as the fraction of developers who would rather give up something that they work on than work with a certain library or API. So these are just things that we in investigated, and they all seem in some way to, to um, give meaningful answers about whether or not an API works for the task that it's designed to solve. So I'm kind of closing with our takeaways that implementing crypto is hard, even if you're an expert, even if you're a security expert. And it's um, not very easy, and it's not enough to design an API for simplicity. Usability is more than just limiting choices. And also, even if you design for usability, if you don't test it, maybe you just say you designed something for usability, but it's not actually usable. Um, we give these questions that you can use to try to figure out where your API is usable and where it's not. We also think that a full feature set is very important to have something that is usable, because if it only works in a fraction of cases that you might need it for, then people will just use something else. And also that documentation is important for usability and also for security. So um, there's one meme that one frustrated um, person left us. I, I don't know if you can see it here before they gave up. Um, and this is kind of, this is kind of um, the, the thing that stuck with, the, with, the, with me the most. When you design something for people, documentation is what you use to communicate with them. And if your documentation is bad, you should feel bad. And, give it more effort, even though it's nobody's favorite task. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. OK, anyone have questions for Yasmin? Can I have your mic? <laughs> At least one of those uh, libraries you r use here, I used it once, and when you went to the Actual crypto routines you had to call a sub package was was called hazardous material. Yeah. So so in this case um, you're supposed to know what you're doing, but we couldn't do what we would like to do otherwise. Um, what's your position on giving low level access to people who supposedly know, or to put it around, or the well you answered it also that the high level APIs are they rich enough? So I think the. Um, the one you mean is Cryptography.io, which was the one that kind of worked best here in all cases. So the approach seems to be not that bad. They're not the only ones with the approach. Um, I think what maybe made this okay in this case was maybe their documentation. So they were able to provide, like, you know, like, if you don't know what you're doing, please don't do this, but if you're still doing it, at least here's a code snippet that you can use to maybe do what you maybe shouldn't be doing because you might not know what you're doing. So it's, it's probably the better alternative to say, this is not supported, go away, use something else. <laughs> okay. Over here. Um, I would like to know if there are some uh, correlations between the success rate of participant and the time they used to solve the, um, yeah, the task. So you didn't mention any time consumption of the participant. So did they oh, yeah. use like one hour or did they read the whole documentation and after four hours they know all about security and how to do that and then they solve the task? There were, there, um, so, so people took roughly one hour to finish across, across conditions if they finished successfully. And we mostly used time measurement to figure out when someone had given up and when we could kind of um, assign, um, kind of start inviting new people and sh shut their instance that they were using down. That's a, that's a pretty good question. I think there, were no, there was no clear distinction in, in, in time usage and they were 
they were closely clustered together, but we should have looked at that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Are there questions in the top? It's hard to see, wave your hand. Okay, I have a hopefully simple question. Is there any hope for humanity? <laughs> the, the hope is here in this room. <laughs> Okay, let's thank Yasmin.